so while it's not a direct insight, um, this is directly tied to an, an important insight and it's directly related to it. And that is that at some point it dawns um, fully that everything, all experience, all perception, realization, the potential to wake up from suffering, suffering itself, apparent form, all of it emerges from, well, I'm just going to say emptiness because I don't have a word for it, but it emerges from something that is altogether beyond the human dimension or not graspable by the human dimension, not graspable by the context of the human mind. It's literally just not possible. And that can create a lot of frustration at first in this process, but as we start to wake up, as identity structures start to fall away, um, we start to perceive it directly, and that is insight. Um, and yet, for, for quite some time, uh, we still have a, a tendency to fall back into doubt, so a, a, for, a sort of form of doubt, a doubt such that we trust our conditioned experiences, our conditioned belief systems, our conditioned <laughs> behaviors, our conditioned responses to emotions, we trust that above what I'm calling emptiness, or perhaps we could call it the unconditioned, or we could call it your intuition when your intuition goes beyond all definitions, all boundaries, all contexts, altogether beyond. From that, everything emerges, the appearance of everything, the appearance of awareness, all of it. <clears throat> and it's happening right now. And not only is it emerging from it, it is it. So when this insight or this, um, I guess this trust related to, to an insight, to a direct experiential insight, uh, when it matures, there is a great relaxation. Actually, Chad's uh, recitation earlier points directly to this. The exchange between the Zen teacher and student uh, points to this very clearly. Even though this isn't exactly true, I could say, once you take on this undertaking, this spiritual unfolding, then every movement, every thought, every doubt, every moment of sitting, every moment of relinquishment is itself enlightenment. It is the completion of the entire process. One simple, discrete quanta of experience is the entirety of all that's possible and all that's impossible. So your experience field is blooming with potentiality, clarity, a certain kind of intelligence. So what gets in the way, right? In one sense, it's a, it's a misperception in, in a sense of overwhelm. Like, what do I do with all? How could I possibly manage all this? And you know you can't manage all. It's impossible. It's not manageable. It's like unconditional love. You don't direct unconditional love. It directs everything. And it'll, it'll burn a hole right through you to, to go where it needs to go. Right through your ego structures. Right through your sense of self, in fact. Um, very similar. So we're taught a lesson in mismanagement. We're taught a lesson in how we mismanage and why we mismanage and what it feels like to mismanage and what it feels like to let go of mismanagement. Let go of the need to mismanage. And then everything is perfectly managed already. We see that.
doubt just endlessly says no, but I know an exception to this. It's not like that for me. It's not really like that, is it? And um, to the degree that reality is still structured in the mind for us, doubt is powerful. Those beliefs are very powerful because they will make reality look that way, what appears to be reality, which is not reality. It's the, the reality of the cognitive apparatus. But a little bit of filtering there can make things look very different than they actually are. Make things feel much heavier than they actually are in this very moment. When that's seen, when that's clearly seen and penetrated, then immense weight can become absolutely without any substance, without any strain immediately. So the most subtle shift of the lens Or perhaps it's letting go of the lens, letting go of the illusion there's someone directing that lens of experience, that lens of attention. So you can't mess this up. You can't mess it up anymore. You could miss the ground when you stomp your foot to the ground. Um, but you can kind of fight it. And from the beginning, we're fighting it. We're fighting life. We're refusing to see what's right in front of our face. Now, that can come with a certain stubbornness, but even that's conditioned. We didn't choose to be that way. We didn't choose to have those tendencies, that doubt mass, that blanket of doubt, that blanket of hesitation. We didn't choose any of that. We just sort of found ourselves with it. And by grace, that felt like suffering, felt like do I, have, does it, do I actually have to live this life this way? Causing myself suffering, maybe causing others suffering. So that's grace that we recognize that at all. <laughs> First noble truth. So from the beginning to the end, suffering is the road, it's the path. It's the series of breadcrumbs. So make a study of it, become interested in it. Don't worry about what the suttas say about suffering. Make a study of your own suffering. Make a study of your own resistance. Make a study of your own doubt. Not that it's yours, but what's, what comes into your experience is there to teach you something. So feel into it. And if I could give an, a piece of advice here, there's a lot of ways to do that. There's inquiry, there's holding, holding space, there's you know, adjunctive substances. There's all kinds of things you can do. But if I could give a, an advice on just a little bit of, um, a little bit of a tone or how to lean with it, it would be a lean toward vulnerability. Lean toward not knowing as you come into contact with all of these energies, the energy of self-doubt, the energy, the energy of confusion, the energy of anger, the energy of sadness, the energy of doubt, of um, greed, resentment, guilt. Get familiar with all of those tones of experience. And then always be just a little more open than, than you were previous. Because if we're a little more open, we'll see that there's also something else there, something tainting the experience or modifying it a little bit. Why, why can you feel sadness in one moment, and, but in another context, it's very difficult? Or we resist an emotion in one set of circumstances, whereas in another set of circumstances, we're okay with that emotion. Um, it's nothing about the emotions at all. It's about resistance. And resistance is um, sort of transparent. It's a little hard to, it's hard to pick it up at first. The more we tune into these tones of experience, these emotions, these areas where we feel like we're suffering, 
or have we have the potential to suffer or areas we're afraid of actually we're afraid to go afraid to, to feel into afraid to experience um, we start to pick up that energy signature of resistance of that fundamental no Early on in realization, it can be difficult when we see resistance or when we see that, that tendency to say no. Uh, it can be difficult to completely rectify it. it you, might, you might for a while, uh, or you might get tastes of it, of what it feels like to reverse that, to feel like yes with everything. And it feels very good. It feels very freeing, very right. It feels intrinsically obvious that this is the right way in a sense. This is simplicity, flow, effortlessness, and it's also authentic. And then all of a sudden it's just gone, like it just, just completely gone, nowhere to be found. And there's just resistance again, right? Contraction. So that's how it often is early on. <clears throat> um, and what, what's interesting is what I could say fundamentally gets in the way there is something even more subtler more subtler, more subtle than resistance, subtler than resistance, more subtle than resistance. Um, and it is the self-structure. It's the illusory self-structure, the sense of the self apart from everything. And I say it's more subtle because as we see when we start to inquire and so forth, um, the self is something we assume frequently in conversation, uh, largely in conversation and in thought. We assume it, but we never really look at it. We never really look to see what's there or what's not there. In fact, we're often afraid to look at, look at that. Or we just don't even know how when we try to pick up self-inquiry, it's like really awkward. Why? Why? What do we talk about all day long? What is 99% of our thoughts about? Ourselves. We're a bunch of complete fucking egomaniacs. Like that's, <laughs> if you look at our thought system, that's what we are. Period, right? So why is it so hard to find the self? Shouldn't you be able to turn around and look at it? Or shouldn't you be able to just identify it or feel it full on as a clear knowing? And yet self-inquiry can be really, really challenging initially. It's so slippery sometimes. Um, There was a great, it's like, this is like probably my favorite video ever on YouTube. It's a video of Papaji. If anyone's ever seen it, check it out. It's called Four, Four Minutes to Spiritual Enlightenment or something. It's an, literally an eight minute video. It was back in the, probably the eighties or early eighties maybe. And this woman is asking Papaji, like, can you show me, show me myself is what she's saying. She's kind of speaking with a French accent, I think. And she goes up in front of him and he says, yeah, sit down, make your place. And he starts talking to her and he's, it's masterful the way he does, he interacts with her. Um, but she's clearly ready. Like she is at her end of seeking. She's so exhausted for, you can just tell in her, the way she's asking questions. She's so tired of it. And she can't find herself. She just can't. And I won't spoil it, but it, probably most of us have seen it, but it's like so funny to her when it, when it just hits her. It's so funny. Like it's an awakening. It's like an awakening caught on camera. It's really cool. Um, but that's how slippery this stuff is, right? And then even if you do realize, which some people realize very clearly, the sense of I am, the I am sense, which is not the I am thought, it's not a concept, it's not a conceptual self, it's not a sense of a center, it's much more vast than that. It's much more undeniable, it's undeniable. Um, and then even that, over time, for people who sort of realize or have an awakening, along those lines, even that starts to, to sort of dissolve into this sort of transparency. And then there can be a much more subtle investigation into the self-structure in later realization. Much more subtle because it's, it's as subtle as it gets. With, with non-dual realization, there's nothing to even look with anymore. There's no apparatus of, of a self that can look around at anything because there's no 
sense of space or time anymore. So it's extremely subtle. But you can still feel it tainting experience. You can still feel, it's not tainting, it's like, it's almost like a gravitational pull. It has this gravity to it, but you can't find it. It's like if you were in orbit around something that wasn't visible, perhaps. You feel its pull, you can feel its influence, you can feel it when it's not there and when it is there, and yet you just cannot find it. So perhaps by exhausting the, the looking, at, that's how it just suddenly drops out, and it will at some point. Um, beyond that, beyond that dropping, which is a irreversible, undeniable end of something. Uh, beyond that, you, ha you have the, the potential to rectify that fundamental no, that fundamental resistance to experience um, completely. Because there's nothing taking sides anymore. There's nothing saying yes or no anymore. There's nothing that can be put its finger on the button that says yes or the button that says no. Even preferences. You could even conventionally say you have a preference for coffee versus tea or something like that by observation, and yet there's no way to find anything that has that preference. There's n it's just not there. Not, never. There's no way to find it anymore at all. And with that, you see where delusion sets itself up. You can see where we resist something for the mere fact that there's a thought somewhere stuck in it that says this shouldn't be this way. And that's based in nothing at all. It's based in absolutely nothing. So um, I posted a quote by Suzuki Roshi, Shun, Shunru Suzuki Roshi. Someone, someone who is in a lot of emotional pain asked him, why do we suffer? And he said, no reason. That's exactly right. There is no reason we suffer. There is no reason. Suffering is or it isn't. And so it becomes very binary. You can investigate the root of suffering in a very direct way and just, just eradicate it, reverse it. That's the end of the talk. So if anyone has questions, feel free.